Okay, welcome to the wonderful world of amino acids and proteins. So this, uh, if we were looking at biological molecules as a group, we have uh, already dealt with the carbohydrates, which include monosaccharides, disaccharides and polysaccharides. This is a completely different group within biological molecules. And uh, one of the key differences between proteins and uh, the, the polysaccharides is that proteins contain additional elements. So the sort of basic monomer, the building block of this, these polymer proteins is an amino acid. And I'll just refer you to Dr. Savile's videos on things you need to be able to draw. So drawing an amino acid, central carbon, a hydrogen, carbon, double bonded to oxygen, bonded to an OH group, carbon, central carbon again, bonded this time to nitrogen with two hydrogens, and then this strange letter R. Now R means that it could be anything. So for example, in some amino acids, it might be as simple as a hydrogen. In other amino acids, it might be something quite complicated and ring-shaped. It might be something with, a, and again, nitrogen in it, or it might be something with sulfur in it. So, amino acids always contain nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and some also contain sulfur, the importance of which we'll see later. So, structure of an amino acid, they're called amino acids. This NH2 group is called an amino group. And you won't be shocked to know that this group COOH is the acid group. It's a carboxylic acid. So, carboxylic acid. Um, one of the interesting things about amino acids is that this end is what we call basic. That means it can take up hydrogen ions out of solution. So if you chuck it in an acid, it will obligingly remove some of the acidity from the solution and make a positive ion. If you put it in an alkaline, this end is acid and will give out donate hydrogen acid um, ions to the solution and give it a negative charge. So amino acids can act as buffers, they can actually prevent very small changes in pH. We'll see how proteins can do that too. You also need to know how these molecules are bonded together, so I'm just going to draw two next to each other. So we've got N, H, C, hydrogen, R group, carboxylic acid, and our next amino acid has our amino group, central carbon, hydrogen, carbon, double bond to the oxygen, acid group, and an R, which could be the same or could be different. And if you remember when we did monosaccharides, we said, right, you know, we're, we're going to take the water out from between two. OH groups and uh, the chemists would probably kill me for saying this but nitrogen acts very like oxygen so you can imagine that as an OH group. So again we're going to use that and this and remove the water H2O. What this will leave us with, so now we've joined two monomers together we're going to make a dimer is this, so I'm going to start from this side again, NH2 is unchanged, carbon still bonded to hydrogen, to an R group, to a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, we've lost the OH. On the next one we've got the N, the H, C, H, R, 1, to distinguish it from the other. And now we've taken the water out of there, our carbon's short bond, nitrogen's short bond, and so 
those two are going to bond together to form a peptide bond. Now just like glycosidic is the bond between monomers, the bond in, in carbohydrates, in proteins, the bond between the monomers is called a peptide bond. If we've got two monomers, no shocker here, we're going to call it a dye peptide. If we add more amino acids to this end and more amino acids to this end, we're going to make a polypeptide. So, remembering that all our R groups are different and remembering that we've still got a basic end of the molecule and an acid end of the molecule, it's still going to act as a buffer. We come to the levels of structure. So, we can describe our proteins in various ways and the simplest way to describe, that a scientist would use to describe a protein is to talk about its primary structure. Now all that tells the scientist is how long the polypeptide is and in what order the amino acids. So I've used little smiley face stickers to represent my different amino acids. And you can see that if I'd picked them up off my sheet in any different order, I would have got a different polypeptide. So, for example, uh, that polypeptide has got the two orange stickers next to it and the two yellow stickers, but a different polypeptide might have those amino acids in a different order or even different amino acids. Now, that's important. So, when you're talking about the... Uh, structure of the primary structure, you talk about sequence of amino acids. Why it's important is that the R groups of these amino acids are different. So this red one has a different R group from the yellow or the orange or the green or the blue. So they've all got different R groups with different properties. So some will be charged and have a negative charge, some will be charged and have a positive charge. Some will have a small, you know, will be polar and have a small negative or positive charge. Some will not like water at all and be hydrophobic. Um, some will quite like water. So the way, the way in which the protein will fold depends on that sequence of R groups. So the higher structures are really dependent on, so this doesn't exist in nature, this exists in scientists' minds and papers. Um, the way the pr a protein might fold up depending on its, uh, its interactions give us our higher levels of structure and I think in, you, in the sheet that you've got it says something about complexity. So the thing that most polypeptides will do, because you've got sticking out, you've got oxygens and you've got hydrogens sticking out of each side of the, uh, of the primary structure. The thing that they will do is form hydrogen bonds and that very often, just like the hydrogen bonds in um, amylose, will form a nice spiral. Now that spiral is the kind of first level of, so we've got the first level of structure, we're now on the second level of structure. So these are secondary structure proteins. And sometimes in biology you'll see that written to the little zero above it, meaning secondary. So these form shapes called the alpha helix. So I wouldn't necessarily describe amylose as an alpha helix, a helix certainly. DNA is a helix, it's double helix, but you wouldn't describe it as alpha helix. We're going to reserve alpha helix for these secondary structure proteins. The other shape that we get, and it's a rarer shape, is this one, which is a zigzag. Uh, you can imagine also if you had other zigzags you could hydrogen bond them together into a more sheet-like structure and in fact this is called a beta pleated meaning it's a zigzag sheet because it's very often bonded to other uh, beta 
pleated sheets into a more sheet-like structure. Now the thing about having lots of hydrogen bonds holding these shapes is that these proteins tend to be strong and they are fibrous so they form rope-like structures. So our examples always good to give an example. Alpha helix, uh, an alpha helix, a good example would be keratin and you may not know it but you are familiar with keratin. It's the protein in your skin. It's the protein that makes up your fingernails and makes them so tough, so your fingernails really tough, made of all these alpha helices of keratin. And your hair is a very good example of keratin. Your hair is almost pure keratin. Beta pleated sheets, again, they're strong structures, lots of hydrogen bonds and the example is silk. So we need the bonds, don't we? Hydrogen bonds. So they're holding those shapes of the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. Now that's not to forget that what I've represented by my pipe cleaner is actually the primary structure of the protein. So that blue pipe cleaner is representing a sequence of amino acids that happen to form these two shapes, this alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet. So our secondary structure, next most complicated level. And you guessed it, we're now going to look at tertiary structure proteins. I'm just going to balance my secondary ones there so you can see the difference. So tertiary, which is how you spell it. Again, you sometimes see it like that. This is where you've taken your secondary structure and further folded it up to make a, a more compact, uh, less fibrous, more um, globular shape. Now I always like to think, when I think tertiary structure protein, the first image that comes into my head is uh, egg white, uncooked egg white. So I've got that sort of globby, snotty appearance to it. And that's because the proteins in it are all globular. So I'm not saying that these are not a 3D shape. Clearly a spiral is a 3D shape. Uh, these are described as more complex folding of the secondary structures into a specific 3D shape. Again, which 3D shape depends on these R groups. So if you imagine that the um, green smiley faces are negatively charged and the yellows are positively charged, those will tend to attract each other and fold up into a shape, they'll, they'll want to be next to each other. If you've got two hydrophobic groups, if these two red ones were hydrophobic, they'd want to stay together and stay away from water. If you've got one that would form a hydrogen bond, say your blue and your orange, they, they would fold it round. So the tertiary structure very much depends on which R groups and what properties those have in which order. So our globular proteins tend to be things that we would refer to as metabolically active. So you need to know the bond types. So remembering our properties of our R groups. Obviously hydrogen bonds. You'll be sick of hearing about hydrogen bonds by the end of this topic. We've got ionic interactions, so this is where you've got positively charged and a negatively charged. Hydrogen, of course, is small positive to small negative. We've got hydrophobic interactions, so this is literally means water hating. So if they hate water, they're going to stick together. And if you remember, earlier on in this video I said, yeah, some of these have got sulfur groups in them, some of these uh, amino acids, two of them in fact, cysteine being a key one. So cysteine is C-Y-S, C 
its abbreviation and it contains sulphur and it'll form a nice sulphide link which is actually a covalent, a really strong bond. So this is a sulphide link and it's covalent and really strong. So this will be the last thing to go really before the peptide bond if you were to heat it up. So your hydrophobic, your hydrogen bonds, your ionic bonds are not as strong. Sulphide links jolly strong. So these 3D shapes, where have you heard of shapes before? Hmm, let me think. Enzymes. So all enzymes um, until you get to university are made of protein and they have a specific 3D shape formed by the folding of the protein and it being held in place by these bonds. Um, we've also got things like your immunoglobulins. These are the ones that uh, link on to your bacteria and other things that uh, they don't like to get them to be destroyed. We've got quite a lot of hormones by steroid hormones, uh, mostly proteins. So things that do things in the in the body tend to be tertiary structure proteins, all your blood proteins, your albumins. They're all lovely tertiary structure globular proteins. So that's tertiary structure, further folding of the secondary, held in place by four types of bonds, and you need to know some examples. These are often referred to as being globular proteins because of their specific 3D shape which determines function. I'm going to stick my tertiary structure ones over there. And we're on to our last level of protein structure now, which is quaternary structure. Again, you'd use, often see it as a four with a little dot. <coughs> now these are different primary structure proteins folded into a globular shape and then joined together, mostly by disulfide linkages. The example that you need to know is haemoglobin, which has two polypeptides of one sort folded into one shape, two polypeptides of another sort, so we've got two different polypeptides folded into another shape that are joined together into this sort of unit of four globs. But anyway, quaternary just means different polypeptides joined together, usually by disulfide linkages. So for haemoglobin, which is our example, Hemoglobin, what do you need to know? Very little yet. So hemoglobin transports oxygen in red blood cells. So that's where we find it. And a red blood cell can have millions of molecules of hemoglobin, each of them transporting oxygen. Okay, I think that's about it for proteins. So you need to know the bonding, you need to know the examples, you need to know those terms fibrous and globular, you need to know primary, secondary, tertiary structure, and you need to know that they're folded because of our group interactions.